Good afternoon. I get the unenviable time slot, which is the last one, but I have a feeling that I will probably get many questions. So I will take, Mark, your 10 minutes, <laughs> and, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to answer any questions that you have um, about what we're doing at Google. So this is actually the second year in a row that I've been um, honored to be able to present to all of you. Um, and for those of you who were here last year, rest assured, this is actually a different presentation. It won't be a repeat of what we talked about last year. And I think actually that's a reflection of where Google is and our awareness of our role in the ecosystem. So the first update that I would like to talk about is actually the fact that we have created something called the Google News Initiative. Now this is um, this was announced in March of this year, and it was an intended uh, to try to really capture everything that Google is doing with the news industry. So this moves across everything from our products to our partnerships and our programs. And uh, one of the marquee announcements that we made uh, among a list of dozens of announcements in March was that we were creating um, and committing to spend 300 million US dollars to work with the news industry over the next three years. But that is only part of the many announcements that we made. And to, in today's talk, I mean, I could talk for days about all the different work that we're doing and all the different teams that are involved with the news industry. But today, I would like to talk about how we work to try to build trust, not only uh, you know, in our products, but in the wider ecosystem, because we know how important it is that Google as a technology company, as a means for information for many consumers around the world, how important it is that we are actively participating and in conversations and actively working in this space. So to start, uh, we always start with Google's mission, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Now, for those of you who were here last year, um, you'll know the next line, which is that this is actually, I think, a mission that is quite resonant to the journalists in the room. Journalists have been doing this long before the internet, long before Google ever existed. This idea and this mission to take information and use the expertise of journalism and the ethics and the methodology to help make that understandable to a wider audience. People who are just living their daily lives, who are, whether they're avid news readers or sometime news readers, that they are actually able to understand and make sense of the world around them. Now, you know, being the last presentation of the day, I can say that you know we've often co we've covered this quite a lot, which is that the open web um, has brought unbelievable benefits to humanity. In that, you know, the information has been democratized. Um, it isn't just that certain organizations are the gatekeepers to information. Now, anyone can create a video, they can uh, take a photo, they can write content. Um, in breaking news situations, when there are not reporters on the scene, that eyewitness media can be crucial to helping the world understand what is going on. Now, the challenge also is that then, the world is an incre increasingly noisy place. How can we make sure that high quality information rises to the surface, and how can readers people who are audience members, how can they differentiate what is high quality, what is authoritative from just the noise out there? At Google, we actually believe that journalism has a very important role to play in this ecosystem. Um, we believe deeply about journalism because of the role it plays in uh, fostering a democratic society and ensuring that there is uh, widespread knowledge and free flow of information. This is our CEO, Sundar Pichai. But for those cynical journalists in the room, this actually may be um, heartening in, in that it's not just about uh, principle, but it's also for Google a matter of our bottom line. Um, our services, particularly search, are directly related to having high quality information. When people come to Google, they have an expectation that when they search, they will get high quality information. So 
we need to work very closely with journalists and the news organizations to make sure that that information um, is high quality, that, that we do have many, many options and a large and diverse um, you know, range of news providers that can help provide information to the public. So we understand that building a more informed world requires journalists and technologists to work together. Google is a technology company. And the art of journalism is something that is in some ways quite different from the kind of zeros and ones that engineers really focus on. And so that is why they have, quite frankly, hired more people like me with a you know, journalism background to sort of help to convey and um, communicate the methodology of journalism, the mindset, the process to these people who are making these products that are so important to individual users around the world. So how do we work together to create and elevate and strengthen high quality journalism? The challenge is, can platforms and newsrooms work together to strengthen quality journalism and fight misinformation? Google, of course, brings the technology into the equation. But the journalism is key. And so how can we work together on that front? So the way that we as a company are working on this is, I would say, bucketed into three areas. The first is, within our own company, we want to build products that elevate quality journalism on our platforms. Right? So I will talk quite a lot about sort of how Google does this in both search and in YouTube. Um, but then also, how can we work with the industry to make sure that high quality information and accurate information surfaces, right? So of course you've heard from Mark about the work of the Trust Project. Google is very much interested and involved in that conversation because um, one of the challenges that we all face now is Google at the end of the day is driven, Google search is driven by an algorithm and learning and teaching an algorithm to understand the difference between high quality information and just noise is, is, is not only a challenge um, in terms of the provision of high quality content, but it's a technical and technological challenge to have our algorithms understand that. And then so we talk about the product, the kind of interface between regular users and newsrooms. We talk about newsrooms, how can we make sure that high quality information is produced and that we can read it as a technology company. And then lastly, how can we support education around the issue of um, audiences, media literacy, digital literacy, or um, Tom, I'm going to steal your, your, um, your term now, media fluency, because I actually think that that's a really important part of the equation. Okay, you know, journalists can and newsrooms can do everything they can to provide high quality information. Products like search, Google, can do what we can to make sure that it rises to the surface. But if audiences don't actually want to know, if they don't actively seek out that information, then um, we're really um, not making as much progress as we need to, to change the information ecosystem. So how do we strengthen quality information on our platforms? I will say that this is an ever-present, ever-evolving um, you know, battle against uh, misinformation and disinformation. But let's start from the beginning, which is that Google search is at its core, it is a search engine. It is not an oracle of absolute truth. Ever since search began, there have been bad actors who have been trying to gain the system, right? Because the power is if you're in the top of the rankings, right? So there have always been people who've been trying to gain the system to try to make sure that they get to the top. And this is not just about news or um, facts or information. It's also about making sure that if I sell sneakers, of course, I want to be at the top of the search when somebody's looking for sneakers so that they'll come to me. So people have been trying to game the system since Google started, since search engines began. And so we, uh, but you know, more and more, we've been trying to engage with this question of how we can tackle the issue of misinformation and make sure that high quality information rises to the surface. So I'm gonna take a quick step back and kind of explain basically how search works. There are hundreds of signals that are contributing to how Google ranks content in terms of the search. But two of the most important are relevance and authoritativeness, 
right? So relevance is when you type in a cluster of words, how do we make sure that what you get is exactly what you're looking for? So if I type in Tom Hanks, the actor, volleyball, island, movie, how does Google then know that what I'm looking for is the movie Castaway that was starring Tom Hanks that featured a very poignant scene with a volleyball, right? So relevance is a very important thing. Authoritativeness is the question of how much expertise does the result have um, based and uh, it, how much of it is based on it and how much people trust that source. So this goes to the heart of what Mark was talking about with the trust project, right? And so for a given query, you may have a different balance of relevance and authoritativeness, right? When we are talking about a breaking news situation, a flash flood, a protest, um, a war, um, a, just a, a news event, we want high quality authoritative information and that will likely come from a news source. However, when you're talking about something like, I don't know, if I'm a woodworker and I'm trying to figure out what is the best saw to, what are the best tools to make a table? Um, quite frankly, the source, the authoritative source and the most relevant source is probably not going to be a news organization it actually may be some blogger who who is a woodworker who has tried all the different tools and written a blog about which saw is better for a table or which tool you want to use when you're making a chair, right? So we're constantly working on balancing relevance and authoritativeness. And so then how does this feed into um, our work and the algorithm? At the core of the, of the search is an algorithm that is constantly being fine-tuned. And one thing that's really interesting that actually I only discovered when I first joined Google was that any given day, 15% of all searches are brand new. So you think about that, um, you know, and, and why would it be? Of course, no one searched for um, Fukushima, tsunami, earthquake radiation until that news event happened, right? No one searched for Taylor Swift 1989 until she came out with an album called 1989, right? So constantly the algorithm is trying to calibrate and figure out what is authoritative, what is relevant, how do you sort through what is gonna be the most valuable uh, and authoritative response to that query. And the way that we do that is at the core is an algorithm. But that algorithm is constantly being trained by actual human beings. So we have something called search raters. And what they do is they work in multiple languages. Um, they understand they're from all over the world and have multiple um, understandings of the local context. They're constantly judging the quality of the search results. And the way that they do that is they work on different queries and then they actually look through, they click through the results to see whether or not they are relevant, whether they're authoritative. So in order to make sure that when those, and, and actually it's all very transparent because if you go online, you can actually look up the search rater guidelines that are being used for that search. It's 100, over 160 pages. It's very detailed about how these search raters are actually evaluating the quality of the results they get back. But then this speaks to the question that actually Mark had, which was what is it that Mark received, which is, you know, what's the value of implementing things like the trust project? It's because when you implement that information, those search raters are not news experts. They're regular people. So in fact, when you educate your readers about what you're about, what your editorial standards are, who are the people who are producing this content, that also can inform what a search rater is looking for and how they evaluate the quality and authoritativeness of what they receive and what they're seeing. But we know that particularly in breaking news situations, we have to weigh the authoritativeness of the content. So many of the speakers ahead of me mentioned this issue of the lag. When a breaking news event happens, 
you have this moment where journalists are running around trying to gather the news. They're making phone calls, interviewing people, talking to governments and police and others, trying to understand what is going on in order to write a high quality report. But in that time lag, misinformation will proliferate. Some of it may be eyewitness information that is actually true and valuable, but a lot of it may be in the realm of rumors and whatnot. So we need to make sure that when, though we are in those facing those breaking news moments, that in fact, we are able to, um, to, to, to prioritize authoritative content. Um, and so what we'll do is we'll actually, in search, signal that we are really, really um, dealing with a breaking news situation and create and prioritize authoritative content, many of, uh, many, much of which is actually news provided by journalists. So we are training our systems to recognize and address these crisis events. It is um, a tricky thing to do, and we are constantly tweaking and learning from this. And I will say that this is an evolution. Um, you know, as technology works, you know, when situations arise, we learn from them and we adapt. And so this is why, um, you know, we are making such a point to create closer ties with news organizations. So that, of course, we are trying to monitor as we can at scale around the world. But journalists will be more aware of what's happening locally in their communities. So when we encounter these situations in Korea or the United States or Indonesia, um, and we learn more and do that post-mortem to understand how we can do better, that helps us to then work with the engineers who can improve the product on our side. So I'm not going to spend very much time on this slide because you've heard from Mark, um, who spoke about it much more eloquently than I ever could. But we are working with the industry to develop signals for quality journalism. I would say that one of the big challenges that we've faced in the kind of evolution of the internet is that Individual people are having trouble knowing what the signals are, what the standard signals are for um, the difference between regular news and opinion, high quality content, or um, not so high quality content. We as a company, as a technology company, are also trying to understand how to understand those factors better as well. And so that's why it is so important for newsrooms to engage on the technology side. It isn't enough anymore for news organizations to say, well, of course I have these standards. Of course, you know, we we're doing, you know, the work that we need to be doing and we have these ethical standards and these practices. Um, they need to communicate that in a way that Google and other technology companies, the technologists can actually understand and ingest at scale. So I know that Mark mentioned this as well, but you know, we do find that these trust indicators are having an impact. And I would say that you know, more and more, and I know we'll, we'll talk about this tomorrow, as news organizations are grappling with how to diversify the business model, right? Moving away from not only having just advertising or just print, but also thinking about things like subscriptions and memberships and events and community gatherings. The issue of trust is increasingly important for articulating the brand, the value proposition, the brand of news organizations. And so I think that there are many, many, um, not only are there from the technology side, but also in terms of the you know, general premise of business models um, that you know, incorporating these best practices can be very valuable. Speaking more about how Google as a company can read content, one of the things that we are working on as well is to ensure that when newsrooms are doing this really important work of fact checking, that Google can read that content and actually surface it as well. So, uh, you know, I think that more and more as misinformation, disinformation becomes an issue that readers are very aware of, news organizations are stepping in and saying, we have standards, we know how to verify, and we can do that work and provide the service to our readers. Now, Google, what we would like to do is make sure that when these newsrooms are doing that hard work, that we can then surface it as a fact check as it is in our system. And so there is something called the fact check tag that is shown in Google News as well as search. And essentially what it means is if your news organization does a fact check, 
you actually put some code around it. So you say, um, this is the quote from a politician that we are fact checking. This is our assessment of whether that quote is true or false, um, or partially true or mostly false. And then who is the one who's actually doing the fact check? By creating a system where it's nicely um, kind of divided into these segments, we can then make it easily identifiable and, um, and, and actually have it shown in search in that very clear way. And we're working with third party organizations like the International Fact Checking Network at Pointer to create industry standards, global industry standards that can be adopted by news organizations as they try to implement these kinds of fact checking um, in, in, activities into their newsroom operations. And it's not just about kind of hard news or politics, which is what we constantly focus on a lot. It's also the news that is really important for, and the content that's crucially important for individuals, right, in the area of health. Misinformation around health is actually a major issue. And in some cases, it's a matter of life and death. So this is a really valuable and important place where newsrooms can actually provide a truly desperately needed public service. And they have perhaps other partners that you traditionally wouldn't necessarily have, um, have opportunities to work with, like those in the academic community, the healthcare system. You know, there are opportunities to really partner with these different organizations on this very important area. And so one of the things that Google is working is to pilot expanding fact checks to health information. And in the US, they're working with the National Academies of Science, Engineering, Medicine, um, hospitals like the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the New York Times to see if there's a way that these different organizations can work together on this very important issue. And I personally would love to see this work expanded into Asia just because health, as we know, is such an important part of the misinformation ecosystem. So Google search is um, one big area where people are constantly looking for information from us, but also Google, uh, sorry, YouTube has become increasingly um, a, a place where people seek information. Video content is, um, you know, particularly in Asia, uh, for news, a, an increasingly um, growing area, right? People just love to consume video news content. And so I should say that for YouTube, this has been an evolution, right? Because you know, for a long, long time, YouTube was really best known as a destination for lifestyle videos, right? How to, you know, cook your favorite recipe or how do you, you know, do this makeup tutorial and put on foundation or whatnot, right? I think that this has evolved because now more and more people are going to YouTube as a source of information for news. And so Google and YouTube have tried to really think about critically about, you know, where now that YouTube is a destination for hard news content, for fact-based information, as opposed to lifestyle videos. How does the platform need to evolve and ensure that we are surfacing high quality information when people are looking for it? And so there have been a number of changes over the past few months related to this. And I should say that, um, to start, a lot of what we have learned about surfacing high quality information at Google for search is now actually being transferred to how YouTube is evolving its thinking and adjusting its platform to make sure that it surfaces high quality news. Um, and so there are a number of changes that have been made. Um, first and foremost, actually let me go back to this one. First and foremost, if you are looking at a video that is based on news content, um, the algorithm has been adjusted so that the recommendations that you see further down are also from um, more authoritative newsworthy sources. And so that's a, you know, so that basically when you go to YouTube, if you're looking for news content, that what you get after you read that or watch that first video is actually also um, sources from news, um, news, news sources and others. Um, another thing that we're trying to do is to create more context, right? So Tom has talked, Tom talked about how important context is in what we're trying to do, right? And I think that this is one of the challenges, right? Because it's actually, it's a challenge and an opportunity that the internet has brought. Because we all know that now anyone can keep clicking, keep clicking. If they have a question, they can Google, they can keep asking, they can click further, right? But at the same time, it's a very small space 
that we're looking at when we're talking about a mobile phone, right? So how can we make sure that when someone is viewing content on YouTube, that they can get context for what they're seeing, right? And so um, there are a few different uh, products that we are, or um, adjustments that we're making to the product. Um, and I should say some of the, these are actually being scaled out globally, um, but market by market. So um, I think that it's a, you, if you don't see something here now, you will actually see it perhaps into the future. But this is actually a, roll, um, a rolling uh, rollout for these products. But a few different things that, are, um, that we've added to the YouTube um, product to ensure that we can increase content. First one on the left is publisher context, right? So who is, what is the channel that I'm looking at? Who created this video? Um, and so we are actually working with a number of third party organizations like Wikipedia and Encyclopedia Britannica so that if you are looking at a video from a particular channel, if, for example, it has, it receives funding from the government, um, there will actually be some context around that as well. To give people an idea of the source of that information, who is the publisher behind this? In addition, we are trying to also make sure that when we're talking about certain videos, um, oftentimes things like conspiracy theories or otherwise, um, you know, we want to make sure that there is context behind it. YouTube and Google, we do believe in the importance of free speech. We want to make sure that there are uh, is a venue for an opportunity to uh, express view various viewpoints, um, but we know that in specific cases like conspiracy theories, that it's really important to put context behind it. And again, we are partnering with third party organizations like Encyclopedia Britannica and Wikipedia to create those kinds of contextual boxes, so that if someone is watching a video about the moon landing in the United States and a, a video that asserts that the moon landing didn't happen, that there is a third party contextual box that can actually um, give additional context to that, to that video. And then lastly, one of the challenges we all know is that when it comes to news, if there's a lag between when something happens and the first stories appear in text, there's an even longer lag for video content. Right? Because it just takes time to produce a video. It takes time to render the video. Um, and so acknowledging that there is this gap, but that people are going to YouTube as a destination for this content now, we wanted to make sure that in that period between when something happens and when high quality video news content appears, that we are able to provide additional content. Right? And so the way that we're doing that now is drawing from our search and text-based updates in news and putting that into YouTube in that moment. So it'll also, in those cases, when you have a breaking news context, uh, and this only, I should say, this only really appears when there is a breaking news story, that it'll actually indicate that the story is still developing. It will take and draw from um, content that has been produced in, in text for, and that has been indexed by search and actually feature that and also create a link from that content to wherever it came from. So in this example, you can see here, um, it actually creates a link to USA Today. So that while that video content is being produced and um, you know, is being uploaded, that the reader, the user, the viewer still actually get some additional context. On YouTube, we know that this is an evolving um, and emerging area for YouTube as a platform and for news organizations that are trying to grapple with how can they use YouTube to tell their stories, to, you know, to, to promote and to share their journalism. And so one of the things that we've done was acknowledging that moving into a whole new area, um, you know, into video, into a new platform, is, um, you know, it requires resources and um, can, and, and, and measure some measure of risk. Um, we wanted to help make that transition easier by creating an um, innovation fund particularly for publishers to build video capabilities. Um, Korea is one of, the mar one of the 20 markets where this innovation funding is available. And um, we actually just closed that application process um, earlier this month. And so we're really excited because the idea behind this is we have these wonderful organizations that are producing great content. Um, how can we make sure that we give opportunities to these publishers to um, optimize that content for YouTube and for the millions and millions of people who watch, um, watch YouTube and are seeking news, uh, news information? The other thing that's really important is, you know, as I mentioned, 
engineers are engineers. Google is a technology company. Um, you know, journalists are journalists. Not um, every journalist is particularly savvy when it comes to technology. So how can we find opportunities to work together and share those experiences? And so another one of the announcements that we made in, um, was that there would be a news working group to really engage specifically in the question of how can we make YouTube better for news? And what are the challenges that news publishers are facing in trying to create content for the platform? And then lastly, we are just expanding the support team, specifically targeting the issue of news and YouTube. Um, because we know that you know, as with any new technology, there is a learning curve. And so we want to make sure that um, Google and YouTube have bodies, have people who you can reach out to to help through this transition. So that is a little brief preview of kind of how we are, as a company, are engaging on the product side. So now I'm going to talk about what is really near and dear to my heart and the core of what I do, which is how do we work to combat misinformation in partnership with news organizations in Korea and around the world. So the team that I work for, News Lab, um, is a small but very passionate team that operates around the world. Um, you can see in blue is where we have partnerships and training efforts, and then the black dots are where we actually have physical bodies. So APAC is, um, I would say that we, we, you know, we, we have now four people who are based in the region, which is wonderful. Um, I'm constantly trying to advocate to make sure there are more people because it'd be great to have uh, more representation. Um, and I think that that's an, an ongoing process, but we are working around the region and really trying to focus on how can we bridge that divide between news organizations and technology. A big part of the work that News Lab does is in training. So uh, if you go to our Google News Initiative website, we actually have a learning center that has lessons in a number of languages, including Korean. And so this is a way for individual journalists to just go, if they want to learn more about how they can use Google tools for their journalism, and actually there are a lot of tools that are useful for journalists in their reporting and storytelling, how can they access those tools and learn how to use them better? Um, another thing that we do at News Lab is we work to develop programs. And so I've been really excited because um, Korea actually is one of the um, kind of has one of the longest standing news lab programs um, in Asia Pacific. Uh, we have things like the Google News Lab Fellowship, which is actually entering into its uh, third cycle this year in partnership with Mediati, which is a media startup accelerator. We also have been working with uh, global partners like uh, Global Editors Network and others to have hackathons and other types of uh, kind of events where we are able to bring together technologists, journalists, and, um, and, and, and designers together to work on a problem. And uh, what I love particularly about this team here, this is actually from not this, this year, but um, the previous year, was this is a group of 20-somethings uh, who had uh, in the hackathon that was focused on how do you cover an election, they were actually trying to target the question of context. What they were saying um, in their proposal was that for a lot of millennials, um, you know, this the election was a seminal moment. They maybe they never really paid attention to the news previously, but because of the corruption scandal and what was happening um, in the political sphere, suddenly a lot of young people were interested in what was going on. But the barrier to entry, if you were just starting to read about politics, can be quite high because you don't know the terms. You may not know the people who are involved. Um, and so getting that context when you're trying to read a story can be quite challenging. And so what they were proposing was creating a platform where um, you know, individuals could actually create almost like a Wikipedia of context for written by millennials for millennials about various news events and also about kind of the players behind the sort of politics and breaking news of the day. Training is another, like I said, it's a big part of what we do. Um, I am constantly trying to find ways to scale our training and make sure that it's local and that's localized for local audiences, right? Um, the, the, depending on where you are, certain tools may be actually more valuable than others, right? I think search is one that is kind of valuable to most journalists just because 
so much of the world is now um, has a digital footprint. But you know, in terms of the types of stories where um, maps or imagery or data journalism could be applied, we want to make sure that those examples and the, those lessons are really tailored to the local audience. And so we've been building a number of training networks around the region focused on how to make sure that we can bring this localized training in local language to um, different to different countries. And so la just this year, actually, we've launched the um, AAJA Asia APAC training network. We are, will be expanding it, and um, hopefully you will start to see even more training in Korean um, in, in, the, in the coming months and years. Another area that we're trying to do is take industry experts and give them access to tools, do that deeper level training so that those journalists can then share what they've learned and those case studies and those stories that they've done with their colleagues, right? So that's where the Google News Initiative Academy comes in. And so really working with, for example, experts in video production or experts in verification and fact checking and making sure that they have a community with each other, they get the best in class tools and techniques and that they are able to then share it with a wider audience um, of journalists. Specifically in the misinformation area, um, we have, as, a, as Google News Lab, has been working very closely with partners like First Draft and others to try to engage in the area of verification and fact-checking during elections. So this really started with a project called Election Land in the United States. Um, and then we worked, uh, the, my, my colleague in France um, worked very closely with First Draft to launch a collaborative fact-checking project with more than 30 newsrooms around France to fact check the election. Um, and, and I think that now we are evolving that. So now we've seen these kinds of collaborative fact checking projects all over the world um, in Brazil most recently, but also in Mexico, in Sweden, in the UK, and in Germany. Um, another area where we've been working is to try to build up and really um, support the research around the area of misinformation. And so in that, we've actually been working very closely with Harvard's Information Disorder Project to try to ensure that we can um, make sure that whatever work that we're doing is evidence-based, that there's research that supports the techniques um, and the initiatives that we're doing, and that, that we can amplify that research and share that with our partners around the world. In, uh, closer to home in Indonesia, there is an election that will be coming up in 2019. And so we've actually worked very closely with a number, more than 22 newsrooms, as well as um, an NGO called Check Facta, or sorry, called Mafindo in Indonesia to launch a collaborative fact checking project. And what's amazing about this particular project is that they started earlier this year. They will go through, of course, and um, fact check and verify the I Indonesian election. But they intend to actually keep this going. So it's not just a pop-up for the election, that they will then make this a, a, a long-standing project that they will keep going um, and tackle other areas like health and others into the future. Another area that we are trying to really promote is the idea that journalists can really work together and help each other across borders. I think that's one trend that we're seeing quite a lot um, in the areas of investigative reporting and others. In the area of misinformation, disinformation, fact-checking, and verification, there are a lot of differences between different countries and different news organizations, but there's also a lot of commonality. And so one of the things that we did this year was we brought together over 200 of the top fact-checkers and verification experts in Asia. We brought them to Singapore and gave them the opportunity to share their best practices. They got um, training from First Draft in a three-day boot camp. And another thing that we did was we wanted to bring a little bit of kind of the Google methodology of problem solving to this problem as well. So we actually initiated a design thinking workshop, a design sprint, to try to tackle and build tools to fight misinformation. And so this is actually a prototype that was developed in two days um, during the Trusted Media Summit. And the idea was that um, while much of the West folk, you know, still uses a lot of desktop, in Asia, mobile phones are really the kind of principal way that people engage with the internet. And so we wanted to give a tool to fact checkers and verification experts that was mobile friendly, that was mobile first. And so that was actually what we did here, was to create an app that would allow you to fact check um, photos on your mobile phone. 
And then lastly, before I'll, uh, I'll this, is, this is my final point, the importance of digital media literacy, news literacy, or uh, news fluency. This is something that is very important to Google and we've been working quite a lot on. Um, we know that around the world, not only young people actually, but you know, older people as well, are struggling to distinguish quality information online. Um, we all have our aunties and our grandparents and our parents who send these articles and, you know, we know that they're not true, but, um, you know, that, that digital literacy is, is, is an area of where we need to see a lot of improvement. Um, and so we've been working around the world, and in Asia in particular, and in Korea, to tackle this issue. So um, we've actually been working with the Center for Digital Literacy in Korea to incorporate media literacy training in their digital literacy curriculum. Um, we've been working very closely with the University of Hong Kong and the Asia Foundation to try to scale that work, and um, hopefully we'll be able to see a lot more um, of that work coming into, the, into 2019. Um, and then in addition, we're working with news organizations and uh, coalitions and others around the world to specifically tackling this issue. Um, there is a lot more that Google's doing, and of course, I am probably over time. I can't see, there isn't a clock anywhere. But um, you know, if you'd like to learn more about the work that we're doing, please visit the Google News Initiative website. Um, and I am now here to answer any questions that you have. Thanks very much. So I've got a lot of questions. Yes. YouTube 채널이 상위에 뜨는 경우도 빈번합니다. 이에 대해 현재 구글이 생각하는 해결책이 있나요? That's a really good question. Um, as I mentioned in our in, in my talk, this is whereas I should say whereas Google and search have been grappling with this issue for a long time, this is quite um, a, it's a newer problem for YouTube. Um, just because you know people are now starting to go to YouTube for news, which I think is a wonderful trend. But YouTube as a product has to grapple with this and is working. Um, and so it's an, evolving, um, it's an evolving learning. Every time there's a situation, uh, we learn from it and we try to adjust um, the technology to address it. I would say that you know, the, taking the learnings of how search values or um, prioritizes authoritative content is something that YouTube is definitely working on as well. So I think that that's uh, where we're really kind of seeking. As you mentioned, you know, where are we targeting this right now? I would say that first, it's of course when you see content that you get context, but also if you are searching on YouTube that we are, for when it comes to news content, breaking news events, that we are, we have adjusted the um, algorithm to prioritize authoritative sources in those moments. Now, will there always be, you know, op, you know, events or specific cases where the algorithm doesn't do what we would ideally like it to do? Sure, which is why we are constantly working to improve that algorithm, to improve that technology. And, you know, the truth of the matter is right now, in terms of just the volume of authoritative, high-quality news content on YouTube, it is much smaller than on the open web, right, which is what search is indexing. So that's why we have these innovation grants, because we want to make sure that if people are coming to YouTube to get high-quality information, that there's actually high-quality information there that we can surface. So this is, um, it's a supply problem, it's a supply challenge, it's also a technical challenge that we are working on as well. 네, 다음 질문으로 넘어가겠습니다. 
5.18 항쟁에서 인민군이 투입됐다는 유튜브 영상을 가짜 뉴스인이 삭제해달라는 요구를 유튜브는 거절했습니다. 이유가 뭔가요? 그리고 한국에서는 유튜브가 진보 보수의 진영 싸움에 장이 됐습니다. 가짜 뉴스 거짓 주장이 난무하는 것은 구글의 지향점과 배치되는 것 같은데 대책은 없을까요? 그래서는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는는